Hey, Edith. Hey, Christy. Knock, knock. Who's there? Control freak. Control. Okay, now you say control freak who? Uh. <laughs> I'm Christy. And I'm Edith. We're backyard gardeners from Colorado. And neighbors. And friends. These days, gardening has gotten very popular. And we've noticed more and more people picking our brains for tips and troubleshooting about gardening. We're not experts. We just learned a lot about gardening from the mistakes we made along the way. So welcome to Upside Down Tulips, a fun podcast that celebrates gardening gone wrong. Upside Down. Hi, Christy. <laughs> Are you okay over there? I'm okay. I was in the middle of a yawn. How oh. embarrassing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not well, because this is boring. It's because I'm just really tired. Well, we hope we're not boring for you folks today. Hello, gardeners. Hello, wannabe gardeners. Green thumbs, brown thumbs. Also want to say hello to anybody who is gardening right now while they're listening to us. Ooh, yeah. Which we're limited, but there are parts of the country that are not limited. It's starting, Edith. Yeah, it is. It's March. Um, it's it's exciting. Hey, before we get into our garden update, yeah, can I tell you a very interesting story that I saw today? Yeah, please. I thought you'd like. Um, first of all, I wanted to ask you: Is do you know what the national flower of Ukraine is? Okay, I actually do. Say it it's then. The sunflower, the beautiful sunflower, which we learned in the suburb of Denver called Littleton. It was. It's actually considered a weed. Unbelievable. 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 The beautiful sunflower. Well, I thought you'd be interested about the story of this Ukrainian woman. She's being hailed all over social media because she confronted a heavily armed Russian soldier and offered him some sunflower seeds. Oh my! So that the flowers would grow if he died there on the on Ukraine soil. Oh, that's beautifully dark. Oh, that's that beautiful. Great? Yeah. She said, "Your occupants, your fascists, take these seeds and put them in your pocket, so at least sunflowers will grow when you all die here." Christy, do you know? <laughs> do you know what that reminds me of? What? I'm not sure if it was at Kent State or what, but there was this very famous photograph of a young girl, a young hippie girl, sticking a flower in the rifle of the National Guard or whatever. Right. I don't know what. Remember that? Yes, yes. Very nice. Flowers versus guns. Who do you think is going to win, folks? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, dear. But on the lighter side, mm -hmm. you know, guns will rust, but flowers are forever. Oh, beautiful. And Christy, now folks, you may not believe me, but we do not, talk ahead of time about what we're going to say. So what is really kind of astonishing is I have a whole thing about sunflowers. Wow. About how great they are. I had no idea. Bring it. Christy, do you remember when we did, I think it was episode 27 and 28, we talked about soil and soil remediation and the hard metals, the dangerous metals in baby food mm -hmm. from the soil? Listen to this. This is from the Far Farmer's Almanac. The sunflower is one of many plants that are known to aid in phytoremediation, a process that employs various types of plants to remove, transfer, st transfer stabilize, and or destroy contaminants in our soil, water, and air. So they have found that literally using sunflowers, planting them, they will pull these awful hard metals, you know, arsenic and cesium, et cetera, et cetera, out of the soil. They'll clean the soil, Christy. Beautiful plants. Christy, and they did it at Chernobyl. I was just going to say, we talked about this before. Yeah. Speaking of sunflowers and Ukraine, before I even knew that that was their national flower, uh -huh. they planted sunflowers at Chernobyl. Now, people are planting sunflowers if they find out, like, it, this person that wrote this article found out that he had lead part you know things of lead in his garden so they planted sunflowers and then after planting them they did another soil test in a year and it has significantly dropped that's incredible they're thinking i th i hope they use it in flint michigan oh that's a great idea i mean there's so cuz it does take it out of water as well now if you if you have the arsenic zinc chromium copper mang how do you say manganese or lead 
which a soil test will tell you. Plant some sunflowers, but be really careful. Once the season is over, do not pull them and put them in your compost pile because then you're putting those metals right back oh, in the soil. Wow. They are actually stored in the stalk and the leaves of sunflowers. They also, they also planted sunflowers at Fukushima. Oh, so not even the leaves in the compost pile. No, 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 nothing, nothing. That's good to know because I will put leaves in my compost pile, but I won't put the stalks because they don't they don't break down well. Uh huh. So uh-huh. I just throw those away. No, if you have any kind of hard metals, then just wait and put them in the garbage at the end wow. of the season. Well, you know, in my garden this week, Edith, I planted, I winter sowed sunflowers. So did I, Christy. After after finding this out, so did I. Today, oh, today oh, I winter great. sowed sunflowers. What kind did you p- winter sow? Um, okay, you're gonna look at me funny, but they're actually called Russian sunflowers. <laughs> oh my god! I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I didn't mean it. <laughs> it's, oh no! It's the only seeds that I yeah, had. Yeah. You know, the, the only sure. seeds. That, I think they're called Russian mammoth. Wait a minute. What? That's what I planted too. Russian mammoth. They're mammoth. I planted mammoth sunflowers. They might be called that too. Oh my gosh. Are they from botanical interests? Yes. Yes, I planted them too. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. That's hilarious. Oh, dear. oh my gosh. That's well, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I didn't winter sow them too early, but I think we're going to be okay. I guess we'll find out. We'll find out. I just did three. Thinking, well, if they don't make it, I can try yeah. again. Well, I did 12. Oh, my gosh. But, Christy, we'll see what happens. they're also easy to direct So That's so true, too. Really easy. So. But I kind of figured that, you know, the volunteer sunflowers will start popping up in my garden yep. in end of March. Yes, they so will. So, if they start doing that, then I might as well start, I might as well put some in the milk jug and see what happens. Yeah. I, oh, I, my gosh, I, that's I, so I, funny. If, if, <laughs> that's really funny. If people... Are thinking of winter sowing, don't make the mistake that I made today, which is I got so excited. I had all my tools and I put the soil in and I put the seeds in and I taped it. And then I realized I hadn't put drainage holes. Oh, oh, all that work. So anyway, make sure you do drainage holes. That's super important or they will rot. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Not good. So did you end up like taking them all out and then redoing it? Yes, I did. Oh. Yes, I did. Uh, luckily, I only did that. I did them one at a time. And so. luckily, it was sunflower seeds and not like, you know, lettuce seeds. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I also winter sowed some lettuces, spinach. I did romaine. I did cilantro. I did broccoli, onions, cauliflower. Is it too wow. early for those? I don't know. So I I'll find know. out. Well, we'll find out. I also, Christy, I also winter sowed black crim tomatoes today. It might be too early. But I only did three leeks and something called a bull-nosed red pepper, which is from Mont- Monticello Seeds, which is directly from Thomas Jefferson's Garden. Oh, yes, because you got those from your friend. A gift, yes, from my friend Diane. Yeah. Who was a member of our garden party. Yes, she is. Thank you, Diane. And don't forget, folks, if you want to be a supporter of Upside Down Tulips, you just need to become a member of the garden party, which means that you throw a couple bucks a month to us and you can get fun uh, rewards like seeds from our garden. And think how good you'll feel about yourself. Here you are listening and listening, learning and learning. (laughs) That's right. We do all this research. We make all the mistakes for you. (laughs) So... (laughs) It's like the NPR makes you feel bad. Pledge That's drive. That's exactly what I'm trying to Good do. Good job. Thank you. Well, folks, if you feel bad enough, there's a link in the show notes for you to check out. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a couple other things to tell you about my garden, Oh, please Edith. tell. Well, I was able to get out there a lot this week because the temperature in the Denver metro area has been in the 60s. But Christy, wasn't it too wet? My garden is still so wet. You know, wet. I have to say this, is that I'm kind of going back about what I was saying last month about things to do in the March garden, which is uh-huh. like, don't get out there too early. It's possible. It was a little too early for some things, but Edith, I just couldn't contain myself. Okay. And I just You're had a to wild get, woman. That's what you I are. had to get yeah. out there. And you know how we talked about that soil is alive? Yeah. With all these living organisms and that one tablespoon of soil has more organisms in it than there are people in earth. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And also that I that soil has a natural antidepressant. When you touch it or smell it, right? Yes. Yeah. That there's some sort of bacterium in the soil called a mycobacterium. 
and it has been found to mirror the effects of neurons that drugs like Prozac provide. Christy, it, Christy, are you depressed? Should I be worried? I just felt so good to be out there. Didn't I tell you, you I so needed great. it. Okay. I just felt like the my garden was calling me. Yeah. And you don't need to be worried because I have my garden. I was out there good point. cleaning good things point. away. I felt my mood was better. I felt more relaxed. I felt happier. Um, and the main thing I was doing out there was kind of freeing the iris. Mm -hmm. Maybe I was too soon for that. I'm not entirely sure. But in early spring, friends, it's a great idea to remove the old foliage to allow for fresh new growth and to prevent any disease or those iris borers. Mm -hmm. um, remember, don't divide your irises. Well, if you really want to, you can. But it's best to do that after they finish blooming. Christy, and, Christy, ahead, yeah. speaking of fresh new growth, I noticed on the bottom of my chrysanthemums, I noticed fresh new growth. Nice. All kinds of leaves, bright green. Yeah, I saw a bunch of little things peeking up, um, like uh, uh, autumn sedum was creeping up, and Jupiter's beard is coming alive. Oh, and my forsythia, Edith, oh, is alive. It's alive, and it has what I believe are buds. Oh, my. Already? It's the, it's March. Oh. You know, it's the first. I can't when that blooms. That's I'm going to be so excited. That's the first one. Of course, that's the earliest thing. Yeah. Oh, good. Because I, I killed mine and I forgot that that's the earliest thing. Yeah. And speaking of killing things, my rosemary is still alive. So is mine. Okay. So Mine's mine. alive outside. Mine's Yours alive, is alive inside. inside. Okay, good. Um, while I was out there digging around in my iris, I found a pair of tools from last year. Did you really? <laughs> I did. Like one of those claw fork things, you know? I have a couple yeah. of them. And I went, yeah. oh, that's where that was. I'm still looking for, I have another claw fork that I like a lot too. And so I'll see if I can find it hanging out there. So. Well, that's good. Anything else happening in your garden? Um, I don't think so. I've been going out there every other day just to see if I have any little lettuce guys coming up. Let us go. Might be a little too early. I'm gonna keep going out there. I checked my Bokashi bucket today, which you know that Bokashi, it continues to seep. It's a seeper. <laughs> I'm telling you. And it's not smelling great. So I don't uh -oh. think I'll be doing that experiment again. But what I'm gonna do this coming week is I'm gonna take the compost in one of my bins and I'm gonna drop them into the ground to feed the worms, which is what our topic is about. I'm so excited to talk about worm composting today, Edith. Something I, I never really knew about until we started this podcast. Me either. Me either. I, I, I have found out all these things about it from my friend Marcia and from doing different types of research, as you know we do. Well, before we talk about worm composting, here's a reminder to tell everybody that if there are words or terms you don't understand, please go to our website and check out the funny and informative Upside Down Dictionary. Or click on the link in our show notes. And don't forget we have fun stuff on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. So fun. So very fun. Um, hey, should we listen to a pop play, Edith? Which one? We're, folks, are bringing back one of our favorite pop plays from last year. This we call Jeopardy with Ken Jennings. Oh, okay, good. Good, 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 good. Uh, because who doesn't love Jeopardy? I love Jeopardy. Good. Let's hear it. Hi, I'm Ken Jennings, and I'm your guest host for Jeopardy. Let's meet our contestants. Last week's winner, an actress from Denver, Darla. Hi, I'm Darla, and I won last night. <laughs> and a farmer from South Carolina, Joe Bud Beezer. Hi, I'm Joe Bud Beezer. And finally, we've got, from New Jersey, Anthony Baritone. You call me Tone Baritone. Everybody does. Okay. And where in New Jersey are you from? From all of it. It's all mine. All right. Let's get started, then. Darla, you're in control of the board. Oh, <laughs> uh, oh, how about things I learned from Upside Down Tulips for a hundred? <laughs> that sounds so cute. The answer is Rue. Rue. Darla. What is Kanga's last name? No, that is incorrect. Tone. What is the name of that old broad from the uh, Golden Girls TV show? Are you talking about Rue McClanahan? Yeah, that's the one. I said it. Oh, broad? 
Well, you're a misogynist, Tone. No, I ain't. I'm Catholic. Sorry, Tone. It's wrong. What? This is bullshit. Tone, it's a family show. No swearing. What are you talking about? That's not swearing. Joe Bud? What is an herb with a bitter taste? That is correct. I'll take things I learned on upside down tulips for 200. The answer is worm castings. Worm castings. Darla? Oh, what is it when you make a movie about worms and you need worm actors, so you have to do worm castings? No. What is it when you throw worms and you see who's lands the furthest away? No. Joe Bud. What is what worms cast out of their bodies, also called worm poop, used for fertilizer? Ew. Ken, what are you, a wise guy? I can't say bullshit. But he can say worm poop. Poop is not swearing. Yeah, it is. I can't believe I'm having this conversation. Fortunately, it's time for a commercial break. We'll see you after the break. You hope. Oh, boy. We're back. Hello. Let's talk worms. Christy, let's talk vermicomposting. Ooh, fancy. It is so fancy. And it means worm composting. Now, that doesn't mean you should get out there and compost and kill your worms. <laughs> Good clarification. It doesn't mean that. Some people might have thought that. It doesn't mean worm farming so that you have more worms to stick on a hook. It doesn't mean that either. What it means is to create your own, they call it black gold compost, which is when things have gone through a worm's body and he poops them out. <laughs> it is the absolute best fertilizer known to man and you can make it in your own kitchen wow. or your backyard so listen Chrissy I have all this stuff about it and shout out to my friend Marsha who's also part of our garden party thank you Marsha she does this and she let me come to her house and I looked at how she is doing this it is so so cool okay so I have all these notes so I'm going to start like referring to my notes. Now, vermicomposting, folks, which is you making your own compost, it, you can do it almost anywhere. You can do it indoors. You can do it outdoors. What it is, is you use your food scraps to feed the worms that then poop out the compost. So what you're doing is, one, and of course, once it's done, you take that fertilizer, you're amending your soil, you're getting rid of kitchen garbage, which, when you put it in the landfill, it produces methane, which, of course, adds to uh, global warming, as we all know. And landfills aren't made... People sometimes think that landfills are like a giant compost heap, and they're no, not. not they're actually all. anaerobic, so they're actually trying to prevent things from, you know... Uh-huh. They, they, they have tubes that send the methane out to a different place. Yeah. So it's actually very hard for the food to break down. It is indeed, folks, so you don't want to do it that way. Also, maybe you're a city dweller. Maybe you don't have room for a compost pile. Maybe you don't have a backyard. Maybe you live in an apartment like my friend Vince, who did this vermicomposting from the seventh floor of an apartment building in downtown Denver. Wow. So you could do it in your house or even on your balcony if you're living in an apartment. On your balcony, in your house, outside. You can do it under your sink. Oh, wow. Yes. It's very, very, very wonderful. So... Well, I was just going to say, I heard one story about a person who used who did it as a coffee table. I did what is a A worm? What? <laughs> yeah, worm composting. They said, like, you know, you can just have it right in the middle of your living room and, you know, have it underneath and just put a nice thing under that. I oh, thought, my gosh. I thought, well, wow, that person really went into worm composting. Oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> so he just had a bin, of course. And a top. There yeah. is seepage. So he probably yeah. had a thing underneath it. Here is what worms need. To, um, they need a composter, which means either a bin or a, uh, you can buy what's called a worm tower, which, or a worm trays. Uh, you can buy things for it, so they need that a place to live. Can I also just say, though, Edith, isn't it true that you don't have to spend a lot of money because you could just get like a five, you know, like a five gallon Rubbermaid exactly. bin that is exactly for five right. bucks, right? Poke some holes in it for just poke some holes in it for drainage, and you've got it. And maybe that's the best way to start before you spend a lot of money. Christy, on that's something. a really good point. 
That's my that's my wonderful frugal friend, Christy. <laughs> Love it. Okay. So, yes, exactly. So, you need the composter, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Then you need bedding. Bedding, that doesn't mean linens from your closet. What that means is usually strips of newspaper, strips of cardboard, but something that which you need to dampen, but something that the worms can land in. Plus, they eat that stuff. Oh. They do. They can eat that cardboard. And you need food. So when you get like junk mail, shred it. Unless it has any plastic on it. Gotcha. Unless it has colored ink. Oh, okay. Most black ink is soy based, so that's okay. News- newspaper would be great. Newspaper is great, but not the shiny stuff. Not the shiny circular stuff. Yeah, or like the New York Times magazine. Not right. stuff like gotcha. that. Gotcha. No, okay. That'll kill your worms. Okay, so your bedding should have the consistency of a wrung out sponge. It's really important if you go too dry or too wet, you can either drown your little worms oh. or you can you can dry them out and they get all brittle and horrible. Okay? So that is that. So you have, you can also put in pure untreated peat moss. You can put in a little bit of soil. Mm. You can, Some people put sand in there because it's grit for the worms to help move things along. I find that so interesting that you don't need, you could you could put soil in, but you don't need soil. No, no, no. You don't need soil. A little bit of soil. Not a lot of soil. And here's the reason, Christy, because these are not garden worms. Mm. These are red, they're called red wrigglers are the best ones. They're not earthworms. Right, because you can't just have, you just can't go into your backyard no. and dig up some worms and bring no. them inside. No, they'll die. No. They like to live outdoors. That's where they are. So what is it? What you might be thinking, my goodness, Edith, what is the ideal temperature for that the worms can live? The ideal temperatures are from 59 to 77. Oh. Christy, you look like you have a question. Might your question be, how much do worms eat? Yes. A day? 2,000 worms eat a pound of scraps every day. Wow. So that's probably could be your daily, it could your be. daily food scraps. If it you could, have a banana be. for lunch, and then you have uh-huh. you peel a carrot, and you you're and it adds up. But you have to have two thousand worms. You don't want to overfeed them, which we'll get into a little bit later. Do you have another question? Oh, Christy? I was going to say when you were saying fifty nine to seventy seven mm-hmm. degrees. Uh huh. So that means that's why a lot of people do it inside, depending on where you live. If it gets mm. really, really, really cold. Then you either want to put it, you can, you, you can insulate it, you can put it in the garage, you mm. can put it inside. But you sure don't have to, Christy. Because depending on the size of your bin, worms know to go down into the soil when it's cold. Okay. It's warmer, on the, just like they do in, the, in, the, in your garden. Gotcha. Okay. So, one thing you should remember is make, take your kitchen scraps and cut them into small pieces. Mm. Don't be throwing a cabbage in there. Or a whole banana peel. Or a whole banana peel or a chicken leg like I did with my doomed Bokashi experiment. What kind of chicken, what chicken scrap, what kind of, what kind of <laughs> kitchen, what kind of kitchen scraps can you yeah, use? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Can you use any you. peels? Oh, the ideal diet for composting worms is non-acidic fruit and vegetable scraps. Mm. Grains, bread, coffee grounds, tea bags, and pasta are also fair game. Aged grass clippings, hair... How about that? Hair. Wow. If they mean cat hair, then you and me are on that train. <laughs> and herbivore. Herbivore animal manure are compostable. So what are our herbivores? They are um, cows. Cows. They're not, and they're horses. They're not chickens. Okay. So when you say non-acidic. Yeah. So you're saying like not orange peels. Exactly. And do, do you know why that is? Not mean because to it you? disturbs the pH. The oh, pH gotcha. has to be between 6 and 7, 6.0 and 7.0, or your worms will die. And it'll start to get, get really stinky. Marcia said she got a, what do you call it, a pH detector Oh, for like 10 bucks. That seems like that would be important to have. I think she said it saved her. Because every time you times. say the phrase, Edith, what your phrase? worms will die, yeah. a little part of me gets scared. Because <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, like, you know, it's like animal husbandry. Oh, you know, I don't yes. want to kill, I don't want to kill my worms. Like that no. would be like a compost pile. No. My compost pile can sit out there and just be fine and it'll do what it wants to do, but I'm not killing anything. Christy, if you don't want to kill your worms, don't put processed food 
meat scraps, salty snacks, spicy food, oily sauces, yogurt, pineapple, and bushels of tomatoes too acidic into oh, okay. the bin. So it sounds like everything you could already put in your compost pile with the exception of citrus and tomatoes. Exactly. Exactly. You know what else you can do? Say you have so many kitchen scraps and you can't give it all to the worms that day, freeze it and then unfreeze it and then put it in the bin. Mm. So you never really have to waste that. So let's review. No fats, oils, or dairy products. No large amounts of acidic scraps, pineapple rinds, tomatoes, citrus, peels. A no-no. (laughs) No-no. Also, always bury the food in the bedding. Mm. It makes Don't the, just sprinkle it on top. No, no, no. Try to bury it, but you do want it on top. Well, we'll get to that later. Yeah. Uh, it makes the food easy for the worms to find. It cuts odors. And most importantly, Christy, it discourages flies. Mm-hmm. Fruit fly. You know how we have a fruit fly problem in most of the country, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You want to discourage them. And if you put the food just right on top and not in the bedding, the fruit fries, the fruit fries. <laughs> <laughs> the fruit flies will come. Okay. And we're back for Double Jeopardy. Joe Bud, as both Darla and Tone have won zero amount, you are still in control of the board. I'll take things I learned on upside down tulips for 600, Ken. The answer is Hugelkultur. Tone? What is uh, what a dead Viking says upon entering Valhalla? Hugelkultur! No, Tone. Try to relate to the fact that the category Upside Down Tulips is a gardening podcast. So what? So the answers probably have something to do with gardening. What is in Scandinavia the opposite of cancel culture? So it's culture that hoogles instead of cancels. What the hell is hoogle? It's Scandinavian for hugging. Uh, Did you hear what I just said to Tone about the category? Not really. Tone was making a low growling noise, and I was in fear for my life. You're not the one who should be afraid, darling. (laughs) Thank goodness. Oh, man. Joe Bud. What is a method of gardening based on building little hill-like structures? That is correct. And it's time for Final Jeopardy. Already? That's correct. The answer is companion planting. Contestants, write down your answers for the question companion planting. And here's some music. Da-da-da-da. Time's up. Put down your pens. Already? Really? Tone's still writing. Are you going to tell him to stop? Nope. Darla. What is your answer to the question, companion planting? What is planting in your garden with your loved? And then I ran out of time. I was going to say one, loved one. You know, the one you hoogle. (laughs) That is incorrect. Sorry. Tone. Companion planting. What is when a colleague in the garbage business rats you out and you plant him in a bucket in cement and throw him in the river? Oh, dear. Not that I ever would or had done that ever. That is correct. What? What did you wager, Tone? $20,000. He didn't even have $20,000. And Tone is the new Jeopardy champion, so he'll be back tomorrow when, thank goodness, Aaron Rodgers is your guest host. Okay, everybody, bye-bye now. Ken Jennings out! Good job on that pod play, Edith. Thank you. I know how much you love Jeopardy and I love Jeopardy. And now, well, you wrote this uh, when uh, Ken Jennings was just a guest host, right? right? And right, now right. he's one of the permanent hosts. Yes. And Aaron Rodgers might be the quarterback of the Denver Broncos. Well, we'll see, won't we? Yeah. Amazing how things have changed in the last year. It sure is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sure is. Let's go back to worms. Okay, worms. During my research, Christy, I found an interesting way to get rid of fruit flies, which is a real problem in my kitchen in the summer, as is yours, because we bring in stuff from the garden and we put it on the counter. And then I have a little bucket of my food scraps that I will, you know, that will go out to the compost bin. Here's what we're going to do from now on, Christy. 
We're going to put a bowl of apple cider vinegar with a drop of dish detergent. Put it near where the fruit flies are. It attracts and kills them. It's another example of all the stuff that apple cider vinegar does. Like, or, what does yes. it not do? Really, it's 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 fantastic. Because we were it, just talking that it could also be a rooting harm. You know, a rooting we, we were just talking powder. about it the other day. Yeah. That's right. Okay, folks. So, you where are you going to put your your uh, bin? Well, you probably know where. You don't want to put it like you know in a hallway where people <laughs> have to hurdle over it. Um, put it out of the way somewhere. And remember that they like dark. Worms don't like light. So it could be in a closet. Could be in a closet. Marsha keeps them in her basement. Oh, basement is good. Put under a shelf. And of course, she has a lid as well. And if you can't get them into a dark place, you can simply put a blanket over the top. Okay. In the wintertime, let's let's talk about in the wintertime when it gets really, really cold. You, you probably want, depending on how cold it's going to get, to move the worms to a sheltered location, like a heated location. You know, like... um. A heated outbuilding, a basement somewhere in the house that is out of the way. Um, so if you live in California, yeah. it's possible that you could have this outside all the time. Absolutely. But remember, in the summer, when it gets burning hot, you'll fry your little worms. Oh, no, not again. You oh, don't no. want to do that we either. We keep killing the worms. We okay, kill yeah. the worms. Right. Or if you live in Minnesota, then you have to bring it in. Exactly. You or do in Colorado, we'd have to bring it, it yeah. in. Yeah. So just, you know, make sure that in the summer, in the heat, they're in the shade and they're in a warm place in the Can winter. You, would you also have to be really careful then about the temperature then? You'd have to, like, you could have a, th- a thermometer near your worms in addition to your pH? I think no. Okay. I don't think it has to be that serious. As long as you know the temperature in your backyard or outside mm-hmm. between 59 and 77. Yeah. But remember that inside the bin, it's going to be a lot warmer. Yeah. And here, you know, we're in the 70s, maybe in May. And then once we're in June, man, it's 80s, yeah. 90s time. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. So you're not doing this to get worms. You're doing the to, this to get fertilizer. Yeah, they're so poo. They're poo. They're or poop, as I say. Poo <laughs> or poop. So how do you easily get the worms and separate them from the actual fertilizer? It depends on what you what structure you have what compost situation you have if you have one of the trays you can simply take that tray out shake it out shake it shake it hopefully the the fertilizer falls down and then you have the worms you put the worms in the bottom of the tower cuz mm-hmm. worms these are built so that worms can climb up and you always want to f- put the food on the top oh so they'll climb up They'll yes. eat. They will poo. They will poo, and they'll stay where the food is. Mm-hmm. So if you want, if if they're ready, if you're ready to harvest your fertilizer, take out that tray. What if you don't have one of those fancy schmancy? What things? if I just have a five gallon bucket? Then bless your heart. <laughs> you know, like a bin, right? Like, like a, a bin, exactly. Well, a couple things you can do. You can put your food scraps in like a an, a mesh onion bag, you know, with the holes in it that you can, and put it in a corner of the bin, the worms will find the food. Mm. Then you can take that bag out and it will be absolutely full of worms. Okay. Right? And then they'll have left the poo on the other side of the bin. And they will have, the poo hopefully will have fallen through the, okay. the, the netting. Um, what if you don't do that? Is there another way you're wondering out there? There is. So Yay. put a tar- <laughs> put a tarp on the ground, okay? Start making mounds, mounds of whatever is in the bin. Uh-huh. Remember that the worms don't like light. The worms will go to the bottom. Oh. They will go straight to the bottom. It might take a while, it might take a few hours. If it takes too long, you know, put a put a shine a light on the top of the mound and they will go fleeing to the bottom <laughs> to safety. And they don't mind. They love fleeing folks, not torture. <laughs> they love it. And, and, and then, then you have separated for the most part, you have separated the worms from the worm castings. Have we said worm castings yet? Cause that's the official designation. Well, 
Yes, I think we have because it was you just have. in. I have, and it was also just in the Jeopardy pod play. Genius, genius. Okay, <laughs> so uh, the way Marsha does it, she just she loves worms so much. She puts on gloves. She reaches in and she just takes the worms. And she she has two bins now. She puts them in the other bin. Oh, you can do that too. Okay, so do you want to? Did, do you ever see a worm and do you ever see they have a band around them? Yeah. Do you know what that means? Well, no. That means that they are sexually active. No, 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 no. Sexually mature. Oh, okay. That means that. <laughs> so it doesn't mean they could still be virgins, but they're just. They got a ring on it. <laughs> <laughs> they've hit puberty. They're, they've hit puberty. That means they can have babies. Okay. They can have babies. If you see that band around them, they can have babies. And I guess I never really knew. They're, worms are hermaphrodites. I do I do remember hearing that because that was always fascinating when you're in junior high. However, they cannot have babies alone. They need another worm. I don't know what parts fit where. That's for the worm gods to figure out, <laughs> but the worm scientists. But they you need two worms, and then both of the worms can have these what are called cocoons, which are lemon-shaped sacks full of worm eggs. Oh. It's the size of a grain of rice. The, the cocoons start white. The darker they get, the more ready they are to hatch. And out come the baby worms. So it's like an egg sack. Yes, thank you. It's exactly like an egg sack. Yes. Which explains, you know, when we dig up our compost in the spring, we see the tiniest worms. Well, they've just hatched. Oh, how cool is that? Also, this is good. The cocoons can wait until the conditions are right to hatch, just like winter sowing. Oh. So you don't have to worry that, oh my gosh, the cocoons are too early. You don't have to worry about that. They'll wait because nature knows what it's doing. So in approximately two to three months, the worm babies should be ready to reproduce. Again, that's sexually active. <laughs> <laughs> However they do it. The worm population, Christy, replenishes itself in a well-run worm bin. So is my right that will happen is that worms will go through its life cycle and yeah. worms will die. They may not die. I don't know if they die. Oh, okay. People don't die when they have kids. <laughs> I just mean when they go through their whole life cycle. Oh, yeah. Not okay, just okay, good, 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 good. The I, reproductive, I to the not, dark. Not, not necessarily the reproductive cycle. But okay, but, sorry. But they'll, they'll continue to make babies. Yes. And th so you'll you could if you do it right, you, oh, you will constantly have worms that yes. will eat your food scraps. Yes. That will keep the scraps out of the landfill. Yes. And, and reward you with their castings. Yes. Which is the most amazing fertilizer ever. Ever, ever, ever. What are some problems people have with with this um, vermiculture? Do you wonder? Yeah. Okay. Overfeeding. Mm -hmm. Overfeeding is a definite problem uh, because the food will rot. If it's not eaten, it will rot and oh. it will stink. And then the, the pH value will probably change then too, wouldn't it? App oh my gosh, yes. It becomes too acidic, yeah. everybody dies. Okay. <laughs> not again. <laughs> Oh, no. Sorry, I'm sorry. It's, it's a worm. It's okay. They have a little wormy heaven. So um, a good thing to do is to feed them every two to three days, be, being conservative in the quantity, and then you will get a feel for how much your mm -hmm. worms are eating. Uh, make sure that your compost bedding is not too wet or too dry. Remember, like a wrung out sponge. Do you need to go in there and water it occasionally then? Yes, Christy. Thank you. I forgot to say that. Yes. If it's too dry, you've got to put a little water. Or you can put things like melon or really juicy stuff oh, in there. yeah, that makes sense. And that will wet it. And also, sometimes people who don't have an actual garden, that I don't know, I don't know why they have, well, because they like worms. Or they could use it for houseplants. Perfect. Oh my gosh, that's what my friend Vince did. Sometimes people forget to harvest the ver the worm castings. You don't want to do that because um, cause it's just silly. <laughs> <laughs> Why waste it? You know, it's there. Why waste it indeed? So when do you harvest it? 
at the, you can harvest it at the start or end of the growing season. Whenever it's getting full, because when they poop out, they're adding to the volume oh. as you are when you're putting in food. So you'll just see it get more you'll and more full. You'll see it get bigger, oh. yeah. Um, or harvest as needed if the worms have been in the bin for at least three months and there are extra worm castings inside. The end. Well, you know, it takes me a whole year to get compost from my compost bin outside, but you're saying I could have fertilizer in three months. You could. Now, now there's a difference in the amount because mm-hmm. your compost pile out there is gigantic. Yeah. <laughs> it's literally gigantic. It's yeah. The size it's, of a, it's completely full right now. It's like too. a tiny house. Yeah. <laughs> so really a bin is not that big, but it is, it has packs much more punch. So instead of using as much as I would from my outside yes. leaf compost, yes. I wouldn't need that much to sprinkle into no. my vegetable garden. Exactly right. Edith, great job. Phew. Thank so you. So the one last question I have yes. is, are you going to start it? I'm thinking about it, Christy. I'm thinking about it. Right now, I'm too busy to want to do it, but it sounds like it's so wonderful and fun. Can't wait. We are should gonna, both do it. Are you going to do it? I think we should. I think we should I'm, do that. You, and I think, are you going to do it? <laughs> I think I should. I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> tick, tick, boom. What time is oh, it, I Christy? I love that movie. It was so good. <laughs> It's mailbag time, Edith. Oh, look, you have a letter in your hand. Ring, ring. Ring, ring. (laughs) This letter is from Colleen from Massachusetts. Hi, Christy and Edith. I love the podcast, especially the puns and pod plays. See, Edith, people love puns. They sure do. I'm really surprised, but no blame. That's fine. I live in Massachusetts, and I have a problem with poison ivy. We bought our home almost seven years ago. It was a bit of a rushed situation, and we also looked at it during the winter, which had had a heavy snow piled up almost six feet in some places. Because of the snow, we were unable to tell what the yard looked like, other than that there was a lot of brush and trees. It looked beautiful. We were told that under the snow, there was a beautiful flower garden. That never even occurred to me that you can't tell what's under the snow in snowy places. Wow. Interesting. So we ended up buying the house, and when spring came and all the snow melted, the gardens turned out to be all invasive plants. Oh, no. (laughs) Multiflora rose, bittersweet vines, autumn olive. We have been working on controlling the invasive and planting food, flowers, and letting native asters, goldenrod, milkweed, etc. grow back. But one of the big problem areas we have is almost the entire front of our yard all along the road is poison ivy. Oh, no. All along the front? Oh, no. I thought about keeping it to keep pesky neighbors away. (laughs) She's funny. (laughs) And we have two young kids who I don't want to get into it. We do not use chemicals, and I don't even want to try hand pulling it. I've tried vinegar and dish soap. It has worked a little, but I've heard since then that it is bad for the insects and other animals that are living on the plants. My latest strategy is to put cardboard over it and then throw the brush I don't want on my compost pile onto it. Do you have any tips for poison ivy control? Seeds I could throw on it that might compete it? We're on a tight budget, so I can't mulch it. (laughs) Thanks, Colleen. Wow, what a great letter. I remember poison ivy from when I lived in Pennsylvania as a kid. Yeah? It's terrible. Well, that's the whole thing is you know if you have poison ivy because of the whole the, the old rhyme, leaves of three, let it be. Do you remember that from 4-H? Yes. When you were in 4-H? Yes. I remember yes, from Girl Scouts. Well, poison ivy, Colleen, we're so sorry you have it because it can be really tricky to get rid of. And it's because not only does it spread by seed, yeah, but it also spreads by rhizomes underneath the soil. Oh, no. So, like, I had that problem with quack grass. It and spreads underneath. I had that problem with, and still do with creeping bellflower. Yes, yes, exactly. So it's one of those type of things. And also, did you know, Edith, that the irritant in poison ivy is called urechiol, and it is spread through an oil that you can't see or feel? No. It is often believed that a poison ivy rash is spread by scratching, but the scratching happens before the rash appears when the urechiol is accidentally transferred around the body. So, for example, you get it on your hand and then you touch your face. You transfer the oils from your face oh and you spread it 
around. Wow. It also can transfer on clothing. It can get on your tools, mm. onto your skin, and cause a reaction. Oh, my goodness. Well, I know you say, Colleen, you don't want to pull it. You know, you don't want to pull it up by hand. But that is one of the recommended methods of non-chemical uses, ways of getting rid of poison ivy. And first of all, you know, we salute you for looking for a non-chemical solution because I've got a couple more out here that are non-chemical related. Can I just say, Christy, that I have been pulling my bellflower for 20 years and <laughs> it is making a dent, but, you know, at least I'm not putting poison on it. Yeah. And I and same thing true with bindweed out here in yes, Colorado. exactly. And... Um, quack grass. That's yeah. what I put. In fact, yeah. I was just looking at it out there today thinking, oh, I'm going to, here comes my, here it comes my, my yeah. dance. So, you know, pulling it is, is often can be an effective way. It's, um, it's easier if the plants are smaller to pull it. Um, but before you do it, just make sure that you're wearing protective gear and you wipe down your tools and you wash your clothes. Otherwise you'll get an irritant from oh, it. Wow. Um, there is a homemade weed killer for poison ivy, one cup salt, yeah, one tablespoon of dish soap, yeah, one tablespoon of vinegar, vinegar, that's right, into a gallon of water, and put that in a DIY weed killer spray, and that can kill it over time. So, so does that to... go through the leaves? Does the do the yeah. leaves eat that? Yeah. So you're not really destroying the soil. Like if it's near a tree, it's not going to hurt the tree. And I think. One tablespoon of vinegar and a gallon of water. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm worried one, about the salt. One cup of salt. And a right. gallon of water. That's very salty. That's true. Yeah. However, in the scheme of things, you could also argue that the poison ivy is not good for the tree either. You know, it could be could choking you? out, really. Okay. you know, okay, natural minerals. So I think, you, you know. You could do that. Mm-hmm. I also don't think vinegar, you know, one tablespoon of vinegar for a gallon of water. Mm-hmm. It just means, it, it, it's probably this is very diluted. And you just may have to do multiple, multiple applications. Mm-hmm. But from gardeners, here, you know what, Colleen? From here to eternity, really. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Gardeners have to be patient. You really do. If only the things we want to live will live and the things we want to die would die. <laughs> oh, boy. Let's start naming names, Christy. Yeah. Um, there's another way to do it, too, which is the water method, which is boil water in a kettle and carefully pour over the plants to drown the roots and repeat often to kill the roots over time. I've actually killed some bindweed that way. It's dangerous though, because I brought out a boiling hot kettle and it is sputtering and super hot. So be careful. Okay. I burned myself. Well, some people are more careful than you, Chris. Yeah. Okay. And as you have said, Colleen, another way to do it is to smother it. Um, place a large plastic tarp or cardboard, like you said, Colleen, over the affected area after pulling the poison ivy out of the ground. So it means pulling mm-hmm. and suffocating. Secure the tarp or your cardboard to smother the plant. And note, it still may sprout and become ground cover underneath this. It will. It will because so. that's what my English ivy is doing. Oh, gee. It, it's exact. But it is so much less than it was. Yeah. So it's just an ongoing fight. That's all. And I guess we'd love to hear how your fight is going. Keep us posted clean on your battle. Uh, be safe while you do it. Make sure that you protect your eyes and your skin. Wear long sleeves, long pants, socks, and work boots. Protect your hands with work gloves. Wear a hazmat suit. You know, Probably. The one you have in the closet. Yeah. 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 Let us know how you're doing because I bet other people would be dying to know how it's happened. So thanks, Colleen. And folks, if you have invasive plants in your yard you want to get rid of or questions or comments uh punny jokes compliments fashion tips i don't know what else you do. um maybe, maybe you have insults maybe you have, maybe you're a smart ass maybe you want to say something funny yeah we'd love to hear it write to us at upside down tulips at gmail or upside down tulips.com edith christy For all the people who are out there right now in their garden, do you have some inspiration for us? I do. You know who it's from? It's from Jane Goodall, who is out there saving apes and orangutans and gorillas. And she said, you cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference, and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. That is so powerful. It is. It's actually empowering. Yeah, it you is. To it's think in about, your hands. Mm-hmm. Think about every decision that you make. You are important. And how that affects your garden. 
beautiful. And the world. Yeah. Yeah. Good job, Edith. Thank you so much, Christy, and thank you, everybody out there, for listening. We are Edith Weiss and Christy Montour Larson. And if you got some laughs and some value out of this week's episode, could you do us a favor? Hit that subscribe, like, or follow button wherever you listen to your podcast. Mm -hmm. And thanks to Denise Gentilini for composing and performing the Upside Down Tulips theme song. If you go to denisegentilini.com, you can find more of her music, or you can find that link at upsidedowntulips.com. And thanks to the many talents of our kind friends, Jeff Parker, Luann Buckstein, and Chris Kendall. And thank you to our excellent yet enigmatic engineer. Maybe someday we'll tell you who he is. And a special thanks to our local nursery and friend of the show, Southwest Garden. Thank you, Carrie. Join us next week for another episode that will delight and amaze you. Woohoo! And Ida, don't forget. Okay. If you make a mistake, your garden will forgive you. Upside down to you.